Hey guys, uh, Trav here. We are live. Going to be talking about existentialism and uh, the human condition with Zemo today. It's the Zemo show on call in. Uh, from Nietzsche to Dostoevsky to uh, Kierkegaard. Um, we're going to be going through a lot of a lot of different uh, existential topics, subtopics. Uh, let me just see if Zemo's live. I'll just go to, this is a faster way. There we go. All right, Zach, you're live, brother. If you're not hearing yourself, uh, you may have to click on your own um, icon there. Or if Mace, if you could help him troubleshoot, that would be great. Those of you on YouTube, we are chilling on the new call-in app. It's a it's an awesome app. This is um, Zemo's first time hosting. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, hold on. I had headphones in. Yeah. Ah, I see. Guys, if you uh, want to jump into the call, if you want to jump into the live discussion, I'm going to give you guys the link. All right, it looks like um, I'm going to have to do it without the headphones. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you clearly. Yeah. Uh. Well, if you couldn't, it wouldn't really uh, matter anyways, because I can't do anything else. All right. Hello and greetings, everyone. My name is Zemo, the host of The Zemo Show, here hosted on Pangburn Philosophy by Pangburn Philosophy. Uh, my... We lost uh, We lost you there, um, Zach. Okay. Lost me? No, at what you point? You're good. You're good. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it's actually probably on my end. Hmm. Hello? Yep. Hey. Are you there, Zach? Hello. Hey. It looks like uh, y'all can still hear me. Yeah, yeah. So we can hear you, man. Um, yeah, so today... Uh, I wanted to talk about existentialism. So, I'll, I, I, I it, it seems like I always pick these sort of wide, uh, large topics, um, deep topics. But my thinking is, you know, hey, this is a philosophy discord, and I don't know about you guys, but I really like philosophy. So that uh, is why I suppose. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this today. Another reason would be, I guess, one of the main reasons. Uh, let, let me give you two. One, I think existentialism is probably the first uh, probably philosophical school of thought, if you will, that I ever heard of. Uh, it has a very catchy name. It sounds very important. Um, and I probably remember as a young child uh, hearing it and wanted to learn about it. And two, uh, I wanted to do it because uh, as much as I tried to learn about it, I can never understand what the fuck it was, right? So uh, I, I think I understand what the fuck it is now, as you will happily uh, hear. And um, so, yeah, so we're going to talk about it today. So uh, without further ado, uh, existentialism, uh, I'm going to give you my, my short little breakdown on it. We can talk about it from there. Uh to me, the main, one of the main, most central claims, and there's several central 
claims or tenets, if you will, um, of existentialism to me is uh, from John Paul Sartre, who is going to make pretty much any list of any list of existential thinkers, philosophers that we have. And his big thing uh, is existence comes before essence, right? Existence comes before essence. So let's talk about that for a second. Okay. So Plato and Aristotle, uh, and I'm sure some of the pre-Socratics, uh, had, and, and many, many philosophers after them, had this idea of an essence, right? So they believed human beings possessed such essences, and that's why they acted and uh, did things in a certain way. They believed certain animals had a certain essence. Uh, you could call it a spirit. You could call it a soul. Um, you could call it a destiny. Um, that could be a good ways of thinking about it. Uh, it could, and with Plato especially, uh, it, it, when I hear uh, essence, I immediately think of the Platonic world of forms, right? So, which is sort of like a Platonic uh, heaven, if you will. So, for a long time, people presumed that essence preceded existence. So, in other words, a baby's born, whatever their destiny is. They had that essence. They had that destiny. Let's say he grows up to be a great warrior. He had that essence within him before his existence. However, metaphysically, you want to justify that, right? Existentialism came along and said, uh, you know, no, no, no. This, this is wrong. Ex existence before essence. Um, in other words, uh, we could say two things about this. One thing that it always means to me is that ex existence, so something has to exist before it has an essence, right? So Sartre would be very skeptical of someone, for example, who said, I'm a great writer. I just haven't written a book yet, right? Now, you can't claim – in it, you, his basic claim is that you can't claim yourself anything attributed to yourself that is not part of your own existence, right? You can't claim you're a good writer if the existence of your great writing does not exist, right? So this is a quintessential existence before essence, right? Another way to think about it – well, uh, let's go back to essence for a second. Um, a knife would say – if it has a wooden handle or if it has a metal handle, but it, it, it would still have the essence of a knife. The handle isn't the determining essential factor of the knife. But if it doesn't have a sharp cutting blade, then it has lost its essence, right? So it, that's a little bit of a way you could think about essence. And also another thing that I think of when I hear this uh, sort of cornerstone catchphrase existence comes before essence is that with that knife for example it, the meaning is imparted onto the knife by a conscious subjective entity which is you or other humans and the meaning or significance of anything that happens is created in the subjective reality uh, a lot of existentialists would claim, or some, I would presume, would claim that uh, things don't have any inherent value. Uh, we, we can get into this a little bit further uh, as we go along, but th that can cover existence before essence for now. It's very central to the claim, and I just want to ask, uh, maybe put this in some of y'all's heads. Uh, I, I want to ask the question about there's certain people who are so good at certain things, like Michael Jordan or uh, Sugar Ray Leonard in boxing, or Mike Tyson, for example, and people will say things like, "I don't, and I can know one thing. I know that he, Mike Tyson, was put on this earth to kick ass, to be an amazing boxer." Now, an uh, an essence uh, before existence argument, like he was put on this earth for a pre predestined reason. But uh, we can get into that later because I think it's interesting because some people are so extraordinary at certain things that it's hard to believe that. Uh, they could have had any other purpose, right? So um, another thing about existentialism is that 
freedom is a big problem, right? Um, there's, there's not. I won't say too much about the underlying metaphysics of existentialism. So uh, most of the more predominant existentialists were atheists, um, but the the father Kierkegaard was a, a very Christian man, and uh, his, his conceptions and ideas are, are, are rather interesting. Uh, another essential thing that comes up is the the problem of freedom. Now, at first glance, people would say you're free, as free as you can be. Uh, that's a good thing. But the, in fact, the existentialists see this as a huge problem, right? In fact, if you think about it, if you're a man in a forest uh, by yourself, you're as free as you're ever going to be. But that does not mean that you will be better off, right? Uh, I think Sartre said, we, you know, we are shockingly free, right? So we can, uh, I'd give the example of, of something like choice paralysis, right? Um, uh, choice paralysis is like a psychological, psychological phenomenon where say you go to the grocery store and you go to the cereal aisle and maybe let's say in the 1950s, there was 20 types of cereal and that was a lot of cereal and it was, you know, kind of hard to make the choice, but you would make your choice. Now you go to the cereal aisle and there's 250 different types of cereal, sugar free, there's sugar, there's ones that are, I don't know, might have fit a certain diet or whatever, what have you. Ones for adults, ones for, ones for kids. Same thing with televisions uh, and television channels nowadays and streaming services. You have so many choices that, in fact, it makes the choice in and of itself more difficult, right? So, yeah, they considered hey, us up, to be shockingly free We're listening to and Zemo this was a big on problem the show, right but existentialism the, the, today the way they wanted us to get through it is to realize that we are shockingly free Join us to on realize call. that we ourselves as subjective entities make the meaning of our lives meaningful um we must realize this and and this is to let's say push past the absurd as they would call it uh, camus famous for the absurd um the absurd the absurdity absurdity rather is sort of this conundrum of you're thrown into the world you didn't choose to be here you didn't choose your parents um we're, we're floating on a speck of dust in a meaningless universe right because um even the christian existential existentialists basically believed in a clockwork god they did not believe in a, uh, they did not believe in a God that interfered in human um, affairs. So thus, uh, you have to uh, create your own philosophy, in other words. And this was uh, in direct opposition to uh, several schools of thought. Um, quietism, mainly, and uh, also uh, nihilism. Uh, now, Nihilism first. People often get existentialism and nihilism confused, right? But the difference between nihilism and, the, and existentialism is rather significant. The existentialist recognizes the absurd. He recognizes the basic meaninglessness of existence and chooses to push past the absurd, to push uh, through it and, and recognize you have meaning. Uh, recognize that you can create the own meaning and it take on that responsibility that take on that individuality and the way they thought you could best do this uh, is kind of being your own person being an individual individuality plays a big part in it so quietism um uh let me go back to nihilism real quick nihilism is basically you stop at the meaninglessness of everything so Everything's meaningless, and you know it's meaningless, and you don't push forward. Check, check. Um, one, quietism, two. on the other hand, is actually All right. a, a one, school two. of philosophical trying thought to crank my, that uh, basically says here. philosophy is not really helpful in a pra like in a practical world sense. It, check one. It just is that basically. Start. Um, it's only check, good check. for like. That should be good. Um, one, two. Pleasurable pursuits, or not even pleasurable pursuits, like therapy. <clears throat> therapy. They basically be saw philosophy is only good for therapy and nothing more, uh, and it really couldn't tell you anything about anything, right? And and Accentuous said no. Um, 
and this is a thing you need to understand existentialism fundamentally deals with the human condition and how we as subjective entities have to live and exist in this world let's just take the word existentialism it has existence in it right it actually hit me well, the other day zemo and maybe some of them would say uh this is rather obvious yes yeah. well i was gonna say like that's that's really weird like what what do they what about like the way philosophy uh deals with the uh ought is problem um that we're presented with uh, in empiricism like did, did they not think like Oh well, it, it, of course. I mean, it's quite easy to see that it serves more of a purpose than like therapy, right? right? It's it's a it's a necessary yes. field because we can't get an ought from an is unless someone can demonstrate that, right? And and this is why they, the existentialists, disagreed. Uh, I, I mean, I agree that quietism is sort of a backwater of philosophy thing, and that's why the existentialists attacked it, yes. But on, on, on the is-ought and on subjective-objective, um, uh, let's go to Kierkegaard for that. Kierkegaard um, thought there was an inherent conflict between the objective and the subjective. So he was a very religious man. So he believed that you could only subjectively, like faith and belief in God is a subjective experience. And that the and he also and a lot of existentialists Thanks, Conrad. Really consider Appreciate that. you know logic I'll and epistemology and Newton to be kind of in this other realm of philosophy as as Kant did with uh, a lot of them were skeptical of pure reasoning, etc. But it's very interesting. All right, with, uh, check one, one, two, two, two. He basically sees there we go. all the um, f like free will versus determinism arguments, and basically the objectivist for subjectivist arguments and the religious versus non-religious arguments as a fundamental misunderstanding between subjective truths and reasoning and objective truths and reasoning right and and that's why he said uh let's take an example real quick to elucidate this uh mortality so you have the objective truth of mortality right which would be I'm a human, and I empirically observe that all humans um, will, are, are going to die, right? And then you have the subjective truth of mortality, which would be something like the realization of the, of the experience of nothingness and th that cold shiver that goes down your spine when you uh, see a dead plant and you realize that could be you and you ponder like very deep subjective truths. And he argues, and I, I think rather correctly, that you cannot use an objective metric like science, for example, um, to com fully explain this. Now, uh, now again, this is in the 1800s, and they this is like pre-psychology, right? So this – existentialism mixes a lot of different things. It is mainly a, a psychology of, how, of sort of how to live in the world. And how to deal with things like freedom and, and uh, individuality and uh, the, the absurdism and meaning, seeming meaninglessness of life and how to generate meaning in that uh, uh, apparent meaninglessness, right? So it's a lot of different things. And a lot of these philosophers, Dostoevsky was a, a very Christian man. Uh, Kierkegaard was very Christian. Nietzsche was very critical of uh, Christianity. Sartre was an atheist. Um, I mean, you, it just runs the gambit. But all of these men, the one thing that shines through about all of these men is that they were rugged individualists. They all believed in their own individual ideas and properties and philosophies and authenticities, right? So. I'll get off my soapbox for a second, but uh, yeah. Anyone who has, uh, uh, and we'll get better at wooing you guys. Uh, but anyone who wants to jump into the conversation, queue up as a caller, and we will uh, we will get to you, and and we're we're going to open this up too, like we did uh, yesterday, and have multiple people live at the same time. So you just have to uh, mute and unmute, like we do on Discord. So uh, yeah, uh, call in and. Uh, yeah, let's talk about existentialism. This is a great topic. Um, so, so Zach, uh, how do you how, how do you summarize existentialism in uh, you know 
the most fundamental way in the simplest form. Um, let me find, let me see if I can. Um, well, I, first, uh, again, e- even professors that teach this at university will tell you that is a very difficult thing to do. Sure. But for, for but for me, I think um, understanding existence before essence covers a good bit of it. Um, but I would say that if I had to summarize it quickly, existentialism is a, a school of thought that started in about the 1800s in philosophy that dealt with subjectivism, individuality, freedom, uh, dread, anxiety, and as in my as in my title of the show, the human condition mm. and how to live in a meaningless, seemingly meaningless universe in a meaningful and ethical and moral way. That, that would be off the top of my head probably the best answer I could give you, which is, again, a very broad answer, right? But it, it's, the be- again, the best I could do. Right. Um, yeah, and uh, I, th- I think that's a great start for sure. Um, did you want to delve into, until we get some callers here, uh, a little bit into Nietzsche or Dostoevsky? Um, I-, I wanted to get into... But we can save them for a little bit later. Um, I wanted to talk about a, a few other things, right? Um, so there's this idea of the other and the look, right? Okay. So these are two concepts. And the other is basically, and it has to deal with the subjective and the subjective observing another another subjective being so the other is me talking to you and me realizing that you have the same i mean it's not the same because we're different people but essentially for intense purposes the same experience right Uh, that you are another conscious entity and the look is when really appreciate it max thank you thank you and i look at you and I, it's like two or three things happening at once. I'm realizing that you're looking at me and you're realizing that I'm realizing that it's kind of an infinite regress. I realize that you realize that I realize. Mm-hmm. But that's what they call the look, right? And um, I don't know how important that is really after I said it, but it's a very fun uh, idea um, and to think about. So. Mm-hmm. And... Well, and back back to the essence, the, the um, existence before essence thing. I asked the question, um, you know, a lot of people will say, for example, LeBron James was put on this planet uh, to play basketball. What do you th- – and this seems to be an essence before existence thing, right? What would you say to someone like that? I would just say that, um, <clears throat> you know, being put, it, it, when we try to apply purpose to uh, existence in this way, uh, like there's this mind behind it, like this mind crafting things. I think we make uh, a mistake. We don't need to do that. Um, what, what I mean, we can say, we can make some claims about existence from a um, deterministic perspective and we can say you know uh, we are all stardust or the velocity of the big bang led to lebron james uh you know being a a titan in um, basketball but i think to apply any level of uh agency or our um or meaning like objective meaning uh i think we make a mistake um it, it, you know because right. because you know someone like there's many people that you know lebron james is a, is a big guy a very fit guy there are many other very big fit guys like lebron james out there but he has a combination right. of some different things uh you know some some of them environmental 
um, that have uh, allowed this path to, um, you know, greatness in a certain, in a particular sport. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to believe that LeBron James uh, would be uh, as influential as he is if he would have been born, um, you know, not not in the United States of America, right? In, he, he, in, in the in the 1650s, plowing oh, a field, exactly. It made a fucking difference. Sure, you know? sure. So, so I mean, I think um, when we make these claims, I understand the colloquial usage. Like when you see someone, there's something very, uh, you know, we kind of get into like uh aesthetics when we see right. how beautifully someone can move with something we're just so inspired by it that right. we uh, you, you know we feel as though there's there's like it, it's it's transcendental right it's it's this yes. transcending feeling it's like when we hear steven tyler uh hit the big dream on except he does like the <laughs> the the high uh you know the high register of that and yeah you know i'm not even gonna try to uh replicate i would but i'd probably get uh thrown out of where, where Man, I'm, you probably I'm get living. banned off calling yeah yeah <laughs> just like youtube <laughs> no, we haven't got banned off youtube that's a joke but yeah yeah guys get We're in just the, trying to get banned off youtube yeah exactly get in the uh caller queue here everyone who's listening in on youtube come and join us on the on the call-in app it's a really really great app for having conversations like this really easy to get into a call uh, much more user-friendly than discord um so consider uh coming over and joining us i gave you guys the link um in the uh in the comment section here and uh hopefully we get some callers so, so I'd like to say a little bit more about the LeBron James. Uh, we'll just use that example. Um, I'll say two things. One, uh, me and you had a uh, discussion uh, several months back, uh, the philosophical coaching thing. But I remember you asked me, what inspires you? And I know art and inspiration uh, is, is a big, uh, I guess you think, you, you consider very important uh, just – for the motivation of people and for other reasons, just for its own sake, for the beauty of it, for the aesthetics, like you said. But if you remember my answer to that was what, it, what inspires me or where I think is beautiful is when uh, people uh, are doing a great thing, the, you know, like the best of the best is performing at their greatest, uh, it, the embodiment of greatness by a great at something. Right. Um, yeah. That is, you know, sure. Who, Whatever it may be, if you're listening to reading the most brilliant book you've ever read or listening to the most brilliant piece of music ever read, or and it doesn't have to be people, but those are just easy things, right? Um, yeah, but, I, I know what you're I know what you're saying. Like it, like when you see people do great things, I feel the same way about animals as well. When I see animals do great things, like like fuck we have uh orangutans who are stealing tools from people or getting their hands on tools somehow you know maybe a maybe a construction project uh they got a couple tools taken away and then you see these fucking orangutans like using tools up in the tree using saws and and stuff like that like that the, this you, kind of greatness the, the, this stuff is, is is deeply inspiring from a scientific and artistic perspective definitely yeah. Have you ever seen the monkeys uh, do the, uh, you know, like 20 numbers will pop up in a row and they'll go in and they'll press them, you know, where they yeah. were. Yeah. It's like a short term memory and they just blow humans out of the water. And that's, it's really incredible. Oh, dude. Uh, also the crow, the test the testing that they've done with yeah. crows when it comes to problem solving. If you put their favorite yes. treat at the end of that, I also saw a really interesting thing recently where they did a, um, uh, uh, they were kind of doing a fairness check on these macaque monkeys, I believe they were using. Uh, and like one macaque monkey would do one thing and receive a, um, you know, what's considered to be a lesser treat than a great. One of them got a, yeah. I yeah. yeah. Did you see one this? One of them gets yeah. a cucumber. Yeah. Yes. One of them gets a yeah. cucumber. The other gets a grape. The other yeah. one sees this. And it's like, okay, motherfucker, you know, you got me this time, but you better give me the grape the second time. Second right. time, 
gives him the other one the grape, gives the guy the cucumber. The monkey throws the cucumber at the experimenter and starts grabbing the bars and shaking them just like a. Yeah, yeah, he was like he was fucking and pissed, and he's yeah he was whipping the cucumber back at him. I just want to say a special shout out to Flim uh, Seven on YouTube. Thank you so much for the uh, super chat. He uh, says a few quid for philosophy. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, it looks like we have a uh, couple callers with J- Jeffrey. I don't know who that guy. Is. Right on. That's and Doolittle. I, I, I know. Yeah, let's get them both in here, man. Yeah. Jenny, Jeffrey, uh, I'm bringing you all in. Uh, do I click the plus yeah. button next to them? Yeah, you should be able to. T- you c- you should. Yeah, you can bring in. Okay, Jeff's now the next caller. If you want to just talk to Jeff, that's cool. If you want to bring Jenny in, you can do that by inviting her to speak. Jeff, are you there? And Jenny, I'm Oh, I think in. you just lost Jeff. I think you probably just canceled Jeff. Jeff, I'll <laughs> back to the queue. So that's I'm what- here, but. Okay. Hey Jenny, welcome back. I'm not sure how to get us all in the same room. I sent uh, Jeff an invite to speak. I think you might have to bring him up as a moderator if you want all four of us on at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. But yeah, Zach, uh, maybe uh, if you've already sent Jeff the invite, then just uh, continue on with Jenny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bring him. You all right there, Zach? All, all I see is the invite to speak. Uh, yep, yep, that's fine. Yeah, you, that'll be the only option. That, it might bump me out, but you can do whatever you want. Also, well, Zach, Zach, sign. Zach, just you make me the Jeffrey, and then make you me a moderator. And said, bring the next caller. Yeah, brought him in, and then I clicked on you, and then it, it, it just bumped him out and brought you in. So Zach, I tried to bring up a Zach, can you make but, me a uh, moderator? Well, while you're here, uh, we'll get to you, Jeffrey. Uh, oh, you probably. couldn't hear me, Zach. Can you just make me a moderator, and I'll help with that. Oh, yeah, just click on you, promote yep. moderator. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, Jenny, uh, what um, do you have any just uh, general statements or questions or anything uh, regarding the topic? Uh, I've enjoyed listening to you describe your views on it. And I took a philosophy class at university in 1986. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's been not a long, it's yeah. been a long time since I thought about these things my own personal epistemology revolves around objectivism Mm -hmm. i'm a student of the books of ayn rand Rand. yeah and And her books the great ayn rand well let me ask you a question Uh, i don't mean to cut you off so early but why do you think she gets so much uh, crap you think it's all political or um i think it's many layers i think on the right people look at her personal morality that Mm -hmm. came through her books but also was her lived experience and and have issues with it she was okay with people changing partners and Mm -hmm. she had an affair with one of her young assistants while she was married to another person and her personal Mm -hmm. life was kind of messy and then the characters in her books don't have live this kind of straight shooter christian life and so people on the right right have issues with that and then people right. on the left, I think, really do not appreciate the way that she bashes Marxism and collectivism with every book. She grew right. up in, yeah. in Soviet Russia and then came here as a young writer and started yeah. to write her books. And um, the left, I think, really does not appreciate that she was so willing to go there with, yeah. I think, We the Living, which was she claims is more of like a biography type novel. And had all of them are, yeah. you know, they really wall up any sort of statism. Yeah. And so if, yeah. if you're a statist, if you're a globalist, yeah, you're going to have issues with her. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I think sh- if you're going to be really, really hard on uh, Marxism or collectivism, etc., uh, I think she has a the best excuse. You know what I mean? She's, she certainly lived it. And, and that's, I, that's I, what I mean. The most if, passionate, if, if, the most if you passionate. know what went on in the Soviet Union, you it, it, that is a perfect excuse. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. I just think the most passionate Americans are those who grew up in China or Cuba or other places where they lived under 
Marxist rule, and they 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 know it by their lived experience. Yeah, I, f- I find that as well. I find I find that as well. All right. Um. So you were talking about uh, you're an objectivist philosophically. Yeah, so, and I took objectivism and I applied it to my personal life as a young mom, okay. and uh, really tried to raise my children with the principle that their greatest happiness was my goal as a parent to do things that would lead to them embracing freedom and freedom principles and that they shouldn't be brought up to feel like they have to sacrifice themselves for the collective of humanity. I wanted Mm -hmm. them to live free. And it's ironic because we've raised them in Boulder, Colorado, which is, we jokingly call it the people's Republic of Boulder because there's so many collectivists here in town that it really does feel like it's just its own little uh, yeah. oasis of Marxism in the midst of Colorado freedom. But um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's been good for my kids who are all adults now to experience uh, the freedom that they had in our home growing up, freedom to think whatever they want, practice yeah. a religion or not develop their own political views and then be surrounded by people who are pretty much marching lockstep with progressivism and many of their friends and whatnot were progressives. Uh, We also have Jeff here, Zach. Um, Jeff, uh, let's get you into the conversation. Uh, What are your thoughts so far? I I was talking, I was going to talk about a totally different uh, direction. Sure. So, I'm willing to go in this direction if we're if we have a question that you want me to answer. It's up to you, Zach. We can shift into my gear if you. You go ahead with what. Well, real quick, I just hold that thought. I just wanted to real quick to respond to what she just said. Um, yeah. I have just written here the core, some of the core principles that come, especially when this is a, well, the core principles of some of the core principles of existentialism. And it's responsibility, freedom individuality meaning authenticity and subjectivity uh or a a, uh, unavoidable subjectivity i guess would be the best way to say that and it seems that how you described how you raise your children seems to very much be in line with those principles now again those are broad sort of stroke principles right but uh nonetheless i see a a connection there um well when when our youngest son chose to get baptized into another faith it was really hard. Yeah. I mean, you teach your own faith to your child and you, you hope anyway that mm. they will feel it and love it. But when they choose not to, it's, it's it feels like you're being stabbed in the heart. And yet mm. overriding those feelings was my sense of, no, he needs to be autonomous in this important choice. Mm. And so I felt passionate about that and supporting him. I went, I went to the baptism. I supported him. I still support him. Mm. Well, that, that seems a very healthy way of handling it, um, I will say. Um, uh, Jenny, I, I wanted to ask you, this is kind of a continuation from other things we've talked about, but um, speaking, since we're talking about existential issues today, do you worry about the, um, the afterlife crisis uh, and what your son's fate might be? No, I do not. Okay. Why? Well, I I trust that there is what's called eternal progression. And by that, I mean our eternal destiny is not necessarily determined by what happens here on earth. And so I believe that if he has made an incorrect choice and comes to regret it, or it keeps him from achieving ultimate salvation, that he can eventually see the error of his ways, if that's the wrong choice for him, and choose another path. And so I I really don't waste a lot of time worrying about the afterlife with my kids and grandkids, or uh, what choices they're making here on earth, unless if it's something criminal, or I really feel like they're getting in trouble with their personal ethics, then I do feel obligated as a parent to say, Hey, you know, I just noticed something here that like when they were teenagers, I had one son whose best friend was really going down a criminal path. And I just felt like he was going to get sucked into this vortex that he did not want to go to. 
and I did not for. Oh shit! Lost the app. Give me two seconds, guys. Misclick. Right. Yeah, it seems it seems that if I could put it back to you in my terms, what you said is that you sort of uh, have, I suppose, faith that the universe will sort of sort it out, uh, will have its way of sorting it out. Well, I. I yeah. I'll just, yes. I'll just. I'll just tell you who I am. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I don't know if you understand our theology, but so much of what I believe is tied up in the afterlife. And I don't think there will be any mistakes that if someone lands in what we perceive to be the top tier of exaltation, they will feel comfortable there and it will be a good fit. And if someone's in a lesser kingdom, which we have three kingdoms in our afterlife, that mm -hmm. that's where they will they will fit best. And then for a very small minority group of people, they will ca be cast into outer darkness or hell. And these will be those who are openly rebellious in their sin and wickedness. And again, you, you <clears throat> this is knowledge that you've collected through your you know your studying of your holy books, correct? We have four books of scripture, mm -hmm. the Bible. We love the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then there's the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, which includes the books of Moses and Abraham. And so, yes, I've learned these things from our scriptures. Right. And, uh, and you know, like we talked last time, I think you acknowledge that these scriptures were written by men who claimed to be divinely inspired. And then you, just to give everyone context, you were okay putting your faith in that, correct? Yeah, I put my faith in it every day. Right. But I love me some Ayn Rand, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, get back to uh, Kierkegaard, right? As I was saying, uh, the father of existentialism, even though uh, he didn't use the term, and he didn't. I don't even think it was around back then. But he's on the list uh, for sure. Uh, he saw uh, a difference between the subjective truth or the the truth that you know about your faith as an experiential aspect, uh, and it, it, he differentiated it from an objective epistemology or truth. And I basically see it as kind of like the hard problem of consciousness. Where I basically always say you you can't uh, quantify qualitative data, which in other words you can't use mathematics. Maybe you can, but we don't know how at the moment. It's very difficult. Uh, but it, it's very difficult to put into a mathematical equation the smell of coffee and why it's a good smell, right? So, and he had some other interesting uh, points of view on. Uh, he was a Protestant, but. Do, do you see that as salient? Do you think that people are talking past each other when it comes to the faith and science, atheism, and belief uh, issue? I don't think they're just talking past each other. I think or, we're in or, open, open warfare. And oh, I think oh. there are people out there agitating for warfare between people of faith and people of science. And I think when it happens, we should point it out and say, yes, this is problematic. I believe we can coexist, but we have to have some level of respect. And for me, I have been deplatformed from so many social media sites. My YouTube was pulled because of my political affiliations and my views on health freedom. That to me, that is one of the big problems in America. And I know some of you guys are up in Canada, but when you have these elites who think it's their privilege and right to cut certain voices out of the conversations of the day that to me is the bigger issue yeah i mean if i if i owned uh my own platform i wouldn't be doing that but do you do you think they should be allowed to do that considering it's their platform jenny well having been deplatformed for what i perceive to be unfair reasons i'm totally down with them getting rid of the the pornography and the the really disgusting sides to 
the marketplace of ideas in terms of just, you know, illegal stuff. And I've seen, I've heard that there are snuff videos on Twitter and all sorts of child porn. Yeah. yeah they, I mean, they have policies against that and they try to get that stuff down as quickly as possible. But of course but, people, but when you're, pl yeah. when you're participating in a political chat yeah. and your ideas are problematic to a bunch of Marxists and collectivists, I, I don't think they should be allowed to do that. I mean, this, this is just, you know, the big issues of the day. And I have, right. I know people who were deleted off of Twitter just for talking about Hunter Biden's laptop. What's that all about? Yeah, I mean, they shouldn't have been deleted for that. We would have to look at, look at, because one thing I do here, Jenny, a, a lot of the time people will be like, I was deleted because I was talking about this. But then, you know, when we, when we go to investigate, it actually wasn't that one in particular. It was something else they said, you know, anti-vaccine uh, rhetoric, which again, if I owned my own platform, I would not be, you know, canceling people because of that. I actually think it's best for the war of ideas to play out in front of uh, the public eye, you know, and Twitter and these, um, these platforms like that are a great place to do that. And I think you would probably, it sounds like you, you agree on that. Oh, I've been on Twitter for 10 years. I was angry at Google. I still am that my blog, which I worked so hard on it and it got up to 40,000 unique visitors a month, hundreds of thousands of clicks. And I started writing some serious investigative journalism around the vaccine issues and Google deplatformed me. They made it. And it still is the case today that if you go look at my analytics, it shows that I have zero traffic, which really affects my ability to get advertisers. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it just makes my site absolutely zero in yeah. SEO, search engine opti optimization. I am not there. And I just think they should not have that much power, especially around these life or death issues. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a question. Well, well again, Google... Um, Google is another, like, like people don't have to use Google as a search engine, right? So it becomes like, do, doesn't Google own that domain? Don't they own that property? Uh, not to say that they can just do whatever they want with people's identity or things like that. Like, of course they have to work within the law of the land, uh, you know, depending on what country or, or what laws are in place wherever. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think Google it is so so long as they're not breaking the law i think they should be able to uh uh use any policies um they want and uh for someone like you jenny i know it sucks but i think people need i think like what colin's doing here and and i i think this just inevitably opens up the opportunity for people to start their own googles to start their own facebooks to start their own youtubes that have you know, an absolute free speech policy, uh, absolute to the point of breaking the law. Uh, I, uh, but, but I do, I, I should say that I am a capitalist and I, I think people who are trying to capitalize uh, within the law of the land, so long as they're not breaking the law, uh, should be free to do so, uh, you know, by their own standard. Well, I can promise you it has affected my home business. It's yeah, affected my, my book sales. And I just feel a little bit perturbed that they would presume to, you know, cut me out of the conversations when I feel like the, the information I share is legit and valid. And honestly, with all the, the things that have been happening just over the last few weeks with Joe Rogan, Dr. Robert Malone, all these doctors who are coming forward with really solid information about the vaccines, yeah. My my work aligns perfectly with what they're claiming. Yeah, I don't and I don't want to I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because we'll have to have another uh, like maybe we'll do we a cover um, this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll we will do a COVID episode soon on here and vaccines. Uh, I uh, I had a um, uh, well uh, no we we'll, we won't delve into that. Go well, ahead. when talking about what my core belief are and it ties into what we talked about on the other shows. I believe individuals should have absolute sovereignty over their own bodies and minds and that parents 
should have absolute sovereignty over the health choices for and in behalf of their minor children. I do not think doctors and nurses should be stepping in and making those important choices. And so that is so much of my work is just this, the sacredness of this is my body. It belongs to me. I will not bow down to the medical gods for anything, you know, so, for anything. So, so, so Jenny, I, ha I have to ask you. So if uh, a kid has, I don't know, they're born with, uh, let's just say MS, right? And the parents believe that a magical potion will cure it. You, will you take the position that, and 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 then after this, we're going to have to get back to existentialism. But would you take this a is position? existentialism? How? <laughs> These Tell are me the how. Important choices. Well, we've had a medical uh, profession. Well, if you, uh, all I'm saying is, if you can connect, well. if you can, if you can connect it to it and show us how, that we would be great. A, we have a medical profession that presumes to know everything. And so they are very happy. But, but this to, isn't. But this <laughs> isn't epistemology. Well, it's it's happiness. It's choice. This is you know existentialism right. is is about being able to make choices about right. how to live a happier life. And if yes. you have a child who has cancer, and all these cancer doctors want to give it chemo and surgery and radiation, and your feeling is no, I want to try herbal healing and chiropractic and alternative healing first. And then maybe I'll explore that. And then these doctors say, no, we're going to force you by law to bow down to the medical gods. Yeah, I have issues with that. That's so much of my work. Mm. And mostly I'm, I'm concerned about childbirth and psychiatric issues. I believe the children are being medicated way too much with psychiatric I, I do, meds. I, I do agree with that. Um, and <laughs> I'm going to say his name until it's worn out. But uh Back to Kierkegaard again, um, he was one of the first people to actually write about anxiety and, and depression. And, and and I'm sure we've all heard the term, and, I knew, and uh, it's going to come up now, existential dread or existential angst or angst as I've heard it pronounced, right? Um, so, you know, th this is very salient to that point. And I just want to connect it back. Um now, uh, real quickly, Kierkegaard's thoughts on this, and Travis, you'll, you'll enjoy this. Uh, he basically believed that he thought it was pretty simple. Humans abide a pleasure and pain uh, metric. They want to maximize pleasure and avoid pain. Mm -hmm. um, however, he, he argued there's much more to life than just seeking pleasure in a hedonistic fashion. And he, he cited the two problems of repetition and boredom, right? Mm -hmm. Like shiny new things quickly become old and dull. And you do a fun thing like sex over and over, and it can become repetitive, right? So the thrill always wears off. So then say you have a hobby, you play guitar, and then you slowly lose interest in that. And then you go to another one and another one. And eventually, he argues, you get to – you finally get to the realization that you're on this hamster wheel of existence, right? And he uh, called the next phase the ethical mode of existence, right? And this gets into the, the concept of a conscience – and um, integrity and the ethical mode of existence is basically where you do things that you know or you consider right for their own sake and thus they are fulfilling in and of themselves and examples of that would be like being a parent which very much connect to what you're saying kelly or obeying secular ethics he, he argued that obeying secular ethics such as you know don't rape and murder uh you know i'm not, I'm not saying that negates uh anything you're arguing about with the secular ethics and the doctors but i, I was just wanting to point that out um and i do absolutely agree that um people I, i'm on anxiety medication myself i do absolutely agree i consider the opioid crisis the or the manufactured opioid crisis to be the crime of the century um, and and i completely agree that there's an over medication um and uh, something oh sorry I was just going to finish with, and something that sort of modern day existentialists uh, have incorporated uh, is sort of a cognitive behavior therapy, right? Because they believe you create your own meanings to things. And if you can um, say you have a fear of elevators and you have a meaning hierarchy in your mind, if I get on the elevator, I'm associating it with inability to breathe, to be trapped. But if you experience it, again, essence, uh, experience before essence once you experience it 
and you realize, oh, it's not that bad, then you can cognitively change your meaning structure and thus underwrite your anxiety and, uh, you know, become self-actualized and all these other things. I, I, I did have a topic uh, r- relating to existentialism, uh, a concept of an- existentialism uh, that I wanted to talk about. If you guys aren't speaking, we are getting white noise from someone's mic. I'm not sure what it is. Just maybe be muted. If, um, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, absurdism. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it is because I think we need to upgrade the language here because the common usage of something that is absurd is like, Okay, sure. If we if we go by what uh, Oxford Dictionary tells us, it's unreasonable, illogical, or inappropriate. These things don't relate to the absurdism that is claimed by people uh, who, who claim to be an absurdist philosophically. I also have to mention that uh, Samuel Beckett, uh, my I guess my second favorite playwright, although he deserves better than that. Um, uh, you know, worked in this field of philosophical absurdism through theater. Anyone who doesn't know of Samuel Beckett, please, please, please go and investigate. Look up Samuel Beckett's play Breath. It will blow your mind for a different What's reason. the one where those two guys are standing on that gray oh, yes. rocky hill? Yeah, Beckett's uh, most famous play, uh, Waiting for Godot, of course. Yes, um, yes. Uh, that is also, an absurd, absurd... Uh, movie or play yes yes indeed. now i think it's called i have to search this uh mouth play yes look up not i um a dramatization by samuel beckett that is not i the when this was staged all they had was this black fabric stretched across the entire plane of the stage and all you could see is the mouth of an actor the mouth through that black wall and and not i uh is uh, is this you know it's a short dramatic monologue um but yeah it, it, anyways there's there's depictions of it on youtube that are very good uh but i i thought i thought it was important to open up this uh, you know this absurdism topic uh you know a concept of existentialism where you know uh things don't have meaning we must uh give meaning to things right including our own existence uh must if we uh must if we care to use the concept of meaning uh, Mm -hmm. at all uh of course you can imagine certain uh iterations of humanity before we got to where we are now uh maybe didn't um wrestle with meaning uh very much as a concept you know uh We're going to eat, we're going to uh, have sex, um, we're going to raise our offspring, we're going to find shelter when, uh, you know, times are tough uh, in our uh, environment. So I I think, uh, and and one, another reason I wanted to bring this up is because I hear uh, a lot of people on on our Discord server and they call themselves Absurdist X. Um, I think I haven't heard that one. And and one thing, oh, well, I'm saying like they'll be like, I'm a rational absurdist, or I'm a this absurdist. Oh, I'm name. that absurdist. I thought absurdist X was like the actual name of the no. what they were. Uh, <laughs> never mind. Never yeah, yeah. So I um I, I was think never it's, good at algebra. I think it's important for people who are using this absurdist label to add a little bit more information. Um, mm. to when they to when they claim this label and and that's just an I think we need to upgrade that because of the way we colloquially colloquially use uh, the the word absurd because people will be like oh I'm an absurdist and then people think things like oh you just well, think things are you know uh, you know unreasonable illogical or inappropriate like the, the, right. I I think this this needs an upgrade. Yeah. Well, I I can say a few things that, that I've done research on. So Camus was big on the absurd part, right? Um, Camus was existentialist, uh, and his definition of absurd of absurdism is basically the conflict between the human tendency to seek inherent value 
and meaning in life and the human inability to find any meaning and, and true meaning or inherent meaning or purpose uh, in a meaningless, seemingly meaningless or chaotic, irrational universe. Now, um, I, I think two things to kind of wrap your head around the absurdist perspective would be the myth of Sisyphus, right? This is yep. sort of how our lives can be, uh, can feel. You get up day after day, you're pushing that boulder up the hill, and it's an, and and you you do it forever, which is another absurd sort of thing to think about. And um, also the the if anybody's ever heard the Carl Sagan pale blue dot, you know, every person you've ever every brilliant mind, every brilliant thought, every piece of music, every amazing photograph, every, you know, kiss has all existed on this tiny speck of dust in this vast universe that is totally inhospitable. Um, you know, and I think that captures sort of the absurdism, especially when you stretch it out to the, you know, like a universalist lens. Things do seem very absurd. Right. Um, but I do also understand what you're saying. I've heard a few people say this. And um, one, I'll just say Chad, I think he said he's an absurdist. And I think he claimed uh, before that human life has no inherent value. Now, it depends on what you mean by that. But I think there's an argument that that could be correct. Well, I mean, it, it's not only an ar- well, it's not only an argument that it could be correct. That's just our best understanding. We haven't we haven't found an object of of uh, did you use the term uh, uh, the concept of meaning there, or how did you describe that? You said uh, in, inherent value. Yeah, yeah, value. There's there's no object we can uh, that we've come across that we can measure the the value of humanity. These are concepts right. of the subject. So yes. until someone uh, finds something in objective reality that they can measure, like maybe maybe they would find it inside our brain. But uh, but until we uh, measure that thing, the the position should be, you know, uh, from a uh, from a Gnostic agnostic perspective, from a knowledge perspective, uh, should be, uh, you know, I don't know if it's out there. Um, and we ought not believe that there is objective value to uh, humanity unless mm-hmm. we find that object and measure it. Mm-hmm. And I'll say the first time I heard that, I thought uh, there's people that are getting high on their own farts. But I thought about it <laughs> and and it makes sense. Um, inherent, if, if you look at just the definition of inherent, it means found in the thing, right? So if you say gold is shiny, it's found in the object. Now, you could argue that's a, uh, you know, a phenomenal, phenomenological uh, subjective experience of gold, but nevertheless, it's in the object, right? We don't have to impart the shininess onto it, right? Um, maybe that's a bad example, but I think it gets it through, right? Mm. So... But yes, I, I, I also agree. What, I want to ask you, Travis, what do you think uh, they are referring to when they say, I'm an absurdist? Oh, I think they're using the philosophical terminology. I just think uh, to the colloquial ears, they are, um, you know, they're going to hear this and think something else about that. That's my only critique. I think they are right to claim, if, they're, if their fundamental claim is that we make our own uh, values up and, and there is no intrinsic meaning, then fine. I mean, they are, uh, yeah. you know, they are using that, the, you know, uh, the, the concept of absurdism uh, as a branch of existentialism correctly. Uh, but, yeah. but I think it's the, to the colloquial ears, uh, it's, it's muddy. Right. And I, and I think what you just said, describing what uh, you thought they mean is pretty widely accepted in secular philo- philosophical thought, you know, sure. Of course, in religious thought, of course, you're going to, for certain reasons, need that inherent meaning, quote unquote. But just another thing to kind of close this door. If I look, if you look at Mars, right, you don't feel tragedy because there's no life there, right? Like if you look at a Some picture do, of your parents, but some some might, but I argue uh, that is very much on the occasion compared to the average person. Mm. 
Um, uh, Elon Musk has come up against much resistance against space wars. Uh, people think it's a dumb idea to go to Mars, and he, well, a, a future without humans going to another planet and living, it seems sad to me. You right? know what? So, it but, it um, always. I, it... And one more thing, I, I want to talk about with the absurdism is, you know, you're with with the freedom and with the abundance of freedom, the problem of freedom in existentialism and the fact that you're making up your own meaning, right. And the search for your inauthentic self. Um, basically, uh, everything you do, everything you say, everything you decide in the existentialist eyes is on you. Okay. They're very, they're very much in the realm of, I mean, most of them were libertarian. Focus on the individual. Yeah. Yeah. They're very much libertarian free will guys. But if you're accepting all the responsibility, it, it's both very scary and very liberating. Now, some argued it should be liberating, but, you know, everything that goes right is on you and everything that goes wrong is on you. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but you're but not only that, the very right and wrong you've made up. And also you're doing this at every second. You're like. I'm doing it now and I'll be doing it five seconds from now and there's no escaping it. Right. So, um, there's very much this sort of, you take the position of your own God, if you will. Right. You are your subjective master of your domain and the existence believe if you, you know, live, uh, true to yourself, that that's the best you can do. Um, Mm. Yeah, I, I'm th- you know, it's looking at morality as more of a mechanism as opposed to this like uh, uh, rules to um, to obey. Um, the uh, there was a oh, you brought up Elon Musk and you know these people that it it never ceases to amaze me when these non visionaries <laughs> who have an imagination about the size of a pea weigh yeah. in on someone who is a visionary and a, and a, and a guy that, you know, has the wealth to do what he says he's going to do. Uh, and then they weigh in just, just by pure argument from ignorance fallacy, they weigh in and they, and they just like, he's not going to be able to do that. Anyone who's here right now, I'll bet you let's bet on it. Um, he, he's got the resources, uh, and, uh, you know, he's willing to spend money to, to make his dreams come true. Like, you know, having a, a small amount of people, uh, you know, living on Mars, moon base, whatever, you know, whatever he, he, he's the first trillionaire on this planet. Right. Um, that's my understanding. And, uh, yeah, look yeah, out, I, I, uh, I, I, as a fan of Elon Musk, as a general fan uh, in the in in the tavern, I will happily take you up on some of the anti Elon arguments. I'm not a total sure. anti Elon guy. Um, There's certain things, though. I think he's lied about certain things. He's uh, said things are going to be out at a certain date, and they weren't. Which I understand happens. But delays before. always happen, man. <laughs> right, but I'm but, not saying there won't delays, be delays. But, <laughs> right, but there's delays, and then there's bullshit promises that you can't actually conjure up in the real amount of time. And well, I would like to, kind of, I would like to hear which ones you're referring the to. Tunnel. Because, the, t- the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, what do you mean that? Why do you think that's bullshit? Well, he said he was going to do it. He said it had a certain, I could send you a video of a guy, an engineer who picks apart the engineering claims and says yeah. to do what he's saying he's doing with what I've seen he has with the metrics and the blueprints, it's literally impossible. Or they would literally have to be shooting the cars through at 300 miles per hour. Some of the dates of some of the cars he said that will have certain features got pushed back. Oh, to next year and to next okay. year. He, 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 and, and one more thing, he lied about um, being poor. Uh, his, his family was actually a, owned a gold mine in South Africa and reportedly quote, this was a quote from them, couldn't close the safe because of all the money. So Yeah, but what does that have to do with what I was referring to? Like I was talking about his ability to innovate and make the projects uh, happen that he wants to happen. And and regarding the 
the project, you know, the, uh, you know, the car carrying mechanism or whatever that thing is, the tunnel thing. Um, uh, so you found an engineer that, that doesn't think they can do what they say they do, but the engineers that work with Elon must think they can. Right. So, so where is it? I just want well, to see uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's uh, that's like projects take a long time, or they might even they right. they, they might even right. uh, bury a project, right? Um, sure. But uh, yeah, it's it's not that it's not possible that they're going to bury projects. I mean, he's already had to bury projects before. But um, right. I mean, like what? I yeah. the 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 thing I'm saying is like when people are like, oh, I'm going to point to this like uh, project that isn't complete yet, or I've heard you know, some different opinions about the engineering. And right. if that's a reason to doubt the man, I think that's a big mistake. Right. Um, I think you can absolutely um, criticize them on certain grounds. Sure. Um, yeah. And it depends. But most people, um, they want, they, they just don't like him because he's rich. I completely agree with people who, who uh, as Donald Trump said, he said, we have to protect our geniuses. He is a genius. He's creative as the fucking day is long, and uh, he does have brilliant ideas, and I do concede. And he has all the money. (laughs) And he has all the money. But one other thing, um, it's sort of this branding that he's done. It's sort of this like fake futurism almost, and he is very futuristic centric, right? But it's sort of a brand, and and that's smart, right? But um, damn, I totally – uh, lost the last point. It wasn't, it wasn't that's all right. <laughs> there was a butt no. there. Uh, guys, we have a lot of you listening in the room. Jump into the call. Let's hear from you guys. Comments, questions, yeah, sure. any anything uh, regarding what we've been talking about. Get your butts we, in here. We never got to. Jeff yeah, I wanted Jeff. to. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah, Jeff. I've been trying to. I've been waiting for a chance to change the subject. I guess. I'm so sorry. I and apologize. get back to what I was going to say originally an hour ago now. <laughs> um, so part of part of it, the, the, the antithesis, I guess, of existentialism is is this claim that Travis keeps repeating. Um, you can't. I hear you say that a lot. And, and I know that you got that from a famous guy from history. And um, you broke up with the Mayan. Can you repeat like that? Okay. What do you want? You, which part do you want me to repeat? So Were Travis, you getting the so Travis, up to? Travis? Travis? So tra- yeah, I can hear him. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. So, so he often says you can't get it off from it is. Oh, and it yeah. seems to be a major part of his worldview. And I, and I, I would like to throw a little wet blanket on that party. Sure. And I, I know it was, I know that that was made up by a famous thinker. David Hume. Dead. I don't, I don't Hume's like to name Davidson. drop what I'm, I, yeah, I know. I, I don't like to name drop because I don't want to, I'm not interested in the history of philosophy class, but I want to talk about, ideas. I am. I think um, it's a good so, way to sort of like, um, pinpoint it for people so they can look up the idea if they can go to okay, the thinker okay. but. well i mean you can you can look up you can't get it off from it is but i want to talk about that idea and, sure um, and not about david hume and i think that um if you look at it, if you look at the world in a slightly different way and just say maybe as an artist look at the negative space um that that worldview is almost entirely dead wrong. Now, it's not entirely dead wrong, but it's almost entirely dead wrong. And if you look at the negative space... What do you mean by negative uh, space, by the way? So, yeah, so like, when you, look at, when you look at a piece of art and you draw um, a picture in the positive space, then that's, you know, that's the foreground. And the negative space is the stuff that's left over behind the picture, right? So sometimes oh, okay. the picture yep. is in the negative space. And sometimes it's in the sometimes it's in the positive space. So, um, if you if you flip just you just flip it around logically, okay. So I mean that, that the statement is perfectly logical, logical, and it's almost entirely dead wrong, because though you can't get an ought from an is, you can get and 
repeatedly will get an ought not from a trident from an is not and and by is not i mean tried and died yeah that's a different claim though right but what i'm what, what i'm trying to explain is that using you can't get an ought from an is as the basis of your, of your worldview will will it's not the basis for my worldview yeah you it's the basis of your worldview but i'm claiming that you say you say that a lot so but a lot of people do have that as a basis of the worldview and it leaves them without an ought and it leaves them without a purpose and it leaves them without a starting point for the morality okay well i'm just waiting for but, you to show but, me the ought from the is because i mean you understand jeff that like people have been trying to demonstrate this uh, throughout all human history, and it has not yet been demonstrated. There is, so. there is a an ought not. No, what I'm talking, I'm telling you it to have you so is to chip away the negative space. This is the life on life on Earth has been a billion year process of things trying all kinds of things freely and failing and dying, and the ought. Oh, you're breaking up, brother. Can you still hear him, Zach, or is it just me? No, it, it, it cut out. Humans, uh, I think I think there's this presupposition. Um, I'm driving sometimes. It yeah, no between, worries. Uh, so there, there's a presupposition that you ought to try to continue to survive. I think if we're talking about the game of life here, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm not entirely and sure. So if what, you do what? something, and then and then it causes you. Not entirely sure what. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're I'm breaking up a little entirely, bit, but is that, well, no, I'm just not even. Not, I'm not even entirely sure. Like, well, what do, exactly? Do little at. just I mean, do do little is trying to make the argument that survival is the ought yes. that comes from the is, but you you are so just subjectively pick, choosing that. So, so I, I guess I would I would put it put it this way. I've I've thought about this too, and I do agree. With what you're saying, that um, um, I, I do think that I mean, even Hume said he said you cannot get it directly from an ought directly from an is. He says you can if you add an extra ought or an extra sort of yeah. You have to start with a presupposition. Subjective, yeah. right. right. Like so, an well, extra, so what and, I'm, hold up, let, hold let me let me stick this in it like an extra subjective that. metric, and that's what Pangman always says. What's your metric now? Like for example, I um, an ought from it is uh, uh, the stove is hot. I ought not to put my hand on it if and if if I add another ought, which is um, if it hurts, right? Uh, or if I ought to think that I should avoid that pain because it's unpleasant. But nevertheless, you cannot. It's very difficult to move, or some would argue impossible, to move directly from there are hot things to you shouldn't do it because it's painful. You can't get, you shouldn't do it because it's painful from the information that it's hot, right? Directly. Now you can inference it, and I, I believe you can. Even Hume said this, and I, I think that's the obvious answer. Like for example, um, you, right, you I mean, can. You're, have, trying to, you're trying to use the you're trying to use the positive space. Yeah, I think so we need to do pretty, little to so I'm clarify. You to from the other, I'm, I'm trying to ask you to look at it from. From the other way around is look at all the things that failed and right. you can and you can oh. chip away oh. all the things that failed oh failed by what standard iterate. but but right. failed we, we need to wrestle so we, I, uh, we can we can talk about exactly. whatever we can talk about whichever game whichever game you're talking about right whichever game you want to talk about but first i'm, I'm just trying to explain with evolution and life all the things that tried and failed are not. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you ought not do the things that tried and failed. No, that's, uh, that's, that's just wrong. Yeah, because, you ought not you do, do that. Those, then, you, then you will not be anymore. Yeah, you ought not do that. But that's, that's if, if you're operating so, under, under the priest. So what I'm saying is you can get an ought not from an is not. So... Yeah, and, yeah. And over billions and billions so can of years, you. you can chip away lots and lots of those ought nots to narrow down 
what you ought to do. So, and that's ab- act- and that's ab- and that is absolutely but, but the how best do you way turn- to solve the most complicated problems in but, any realm. But, so, Jeffrey, let me let me give you an example. Say you really admire the cons, right? And and yeah, yeah. most of them right. died early in age, and they conquered the world. Um, who are you to say that, like, the warrior that might die at 30 is less righteous than uh, someone who stays safe and, and goes on existence, right? Um, that, again, is a subjective metric that you're not um, – that even though you're trying to use it backwards, I think it's still, like, the same. Uh, look, well, all, all I'm saying is that if you fear that you don't – exist for a reason right but really you do exist for a reason the reason that you exist is to exist and to continue to exist and there's always an ought that that's the reason we exist yeah, yeah but we, but yeah. but do little you but do doesn't, doesn't exist hang but, on but so hang on uh, you you're still starting with the presupposition that life is preferential to death well that's what ought means Really, and if you go down to the bottom of any ought claim, no, it it actually doesn't. It doesn't have to. Uh, uh, someone's ought who's about to uh, commit suicide that that presupposition uh, changes for them, right? Death is preferential to life. Um, so I think you're 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 trying to you're trying to present survivalism uh, or or life yeah, is preferential so, um, to death they, uh, as the, does the person who just committed suicide exist after they do that. Um, as far as I can tell, no. Oh, there, there you go. That's all. So, but, but you're right, still, you're starting with the presupposition do little that existence is preferential to non-existence. I mean, honestly, Jeff, all you got to say is, yes, I am starting with that presupposition. I like that presupposition. I think it's a justified presupposition, but it is a presupposition. I think, I mean, anything, I, honestly, it's, it's not exists, it's not that exists, hard. Yeah. And it, you know, but if you just say that, like, it, it, you don't have to really go around and around. But you're, you're claiming that there is no object that that's tied to. I'm cl- what claiming what? Anything that exists has that as a, anything that that exists has existence as a as a value that's measurable. Yes, but that doesn't mean that they get to set the standard for objective morality. Okay, I would say to what you just said, Jeff. Like, um, as far if you look at like cosmology or like uh, quantum physics, like e- yes, each particle is basically a piece of information, data of the universe, right? That. Might, may yeah, bend space yeah. and time or electrons, but um, it's it, its existence does is just its existence. It, it it there's no preferential one way or the other, right? Right, or any or any metadata that's a that's data about the pattern uh, of existence. Of, yeah. Of oh yeah. Well, well, I, what I was right, right. Yeah, I was saying those are inform those are data points, but they are not that morality and value judgments. Those are two totally different things. The existence of matter as data in the universe and the morality of the existence of that matter are two totally separate issues. I don't see. I, I don't see it that way. How? So if you're if you if you think that existing is a value that's measurable and it's inherent in every object and in every meta object, which is a description of the configuration of an object or that persists itself over space and time, then existence is a, is itself an inherent value. And everything that hey, everyone on YouTube, hopefully you guys are enjoying the chat. Uh, have you're a lot saying, of fun here. Make sure you drop value. a like on this video and you're come and join value. us. value, but I, I wonder when you say value, do you mean moral value or like value of data and information? What, yes, I I do I do value. Well, I would I would um, just make I would clarify whenever I'm are saying you, are it. You, I think. Are you asking about positive affect in your own? So mind? something something is either a a value to the subject or not. Like they either value it or not, right? Yes. Wait, so if you subject, defi- if you define yes. value as a property of the subject, then then of course it's subjective. 
by your definition. Yeah, yeah I guess. Uh, it, but but but, you, just, I mean, but if you're going to say point something point. has value without picking up subject, like for instance, uh, water has water value. has great value um, to me uh, by a. Uh, um, life is preferential to death standard, right? Or an existence standard. Um, but water by itself, what intrinsic value does water have? Uh, it continues to exist as water. Yeah, but, but that's it. just an is claim, right? The, again, we're back to the is right. versus ought dilemma. Uh, what, what value does a... Uh, matter anti-matter uh creation and annihilation have yeah yeah that's a that's a good uh it doesn't it doesn't because the because the matter and anti-matter cease to exist yeah, after the, it's after a, it uh annihilates itself yeah it's a process um i, I think that is a, a representation of what is going on in reality and we've modeled based on that but i don't think we can make a a claim uh, uh that that it it has intrinsic value outside of the subject uh, if if that is the case, then we need some. We would need to be able to measure something in objective reality to show us that 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 particle annihilation has value. But what we can say is that it that that process is valuable to the existence right, well, of yeah, X. Matter antimatter doesn't have value, but the water does. Um, uh, it, uh, Jim, you yeah, said it, uh, process, I'll, I'll, I'll say like I agree with. Really what you're saying i agree that an inch like an inch of matter has a value like what is the value of this equation but again um th there's a difference between a data point and and um a, a moral judgment right like water right, does exist as water but but the ought that's a is but the ought of water ought to exist as water for humans to live is it, it, it's it's different Oh man, I wish I could fucking hear Doolittle. Damn truck. The water ought to. Uh, sorry, I'll try to slow down a little so maybe a bit. Uh... <laughs> he's he's driving at the speed of light right now. <laughs> no, I'm just. Uh, it's a. I don't have a perfectly sound insulated car. So yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Um. Well. Uh, um. Did it just. So, so think oh, about sorry. think about it in a different game. Okay, let's let's shift it to a different game and just try to use the same concept. Okay, okay. Um, there is a very sophisticated computer which played StarCraft against itself fifty thousand times without anyone telling it how to play StarCraft or what were the victory conditions, and that computer was called alpha zero or something like that okay right if you heard you've heard about this computer and that computer got yes. so good at playing starcraft that people just can't play against it and when you tell it when you tell it the victory conditions it mm -hmm. it has created its own value system which will allow it to win that game against really anything but itself and when it plays against itself it, it wins half the time so you can't and the so other half of the win. time it it's wins gonna win starcraft <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna win starcraft okay okay and it didn't get how it ought to play starcraft from a system of morality it got it by simply playing it over and over again and whittling away the ways not to play. But again, you must recognize that it it would not do that unless someone programmed it a value or a, or, a, or an ought that winning the game is good. Right? Just as just as Travis yeah, is okay. saying, sure, start yeah. you're starting with the. You have to have yeah, everything you know, has to have an axiom. I think to start with. Sure yeah, I I agree with that with regards to morality. Yeah. Right. So it, you it, have to have. I, so I love talking about yeah, is and on. I really do. Yeah, I think you have to have the presupposition that 
existence is preferential to not existing. And I, I, if you want to have a discussion about morality, um, or, or you have to have some presupposition to start with, but I think you can whittle away all the ought nots mm-hmm. based on things that have ceased to exist. But you can only do that right. if you start with, okay, the, the moral good is to exist as a fundamental metric right. well, you mean, well, because or else, or else you're carving out or else you're flip around what odd means or else you're carving out and then the same game works. Yeah. Okay. Or else you're carving out things without any reason to carve that thing out. Right. You, you need to say like, Oh, okay. We're going to, we're going to look at this from a perspective of uh, existence or wanting to exist uh, as opposed to not exist. So then you're going to, you're going to carve out living under a volcano. You're going to carve out, you know, sticking your head in the mouth of a lion, you know, and all the other, all that other stuff. Yeah. (laughs) But, But yeah, absolutely. Once you, I mean, if you can all three get on the same page of that, then with the subjective presupposition, then you can have the real fun, which is arguing about which presuppositions are better or justified. And and what you're talking about with the negation thing is sort of like monkey see, monkey do, learn from other people's mistakes. Like if you do value living, it, it would make a lot of sense to, for example, not – um, not construct your society as the old Soviet Union if you value human life, right? Um, I, I do believe that. And and on the conversely, uh, I, because I, I love discussing the is all problem. Uh, if if everything that is can't at least lead you, I'm not saying you can directly derive it from the facts, but if everything that is can't lead you to what you ought to do, um, I I think that that's pretty evident. Earlier, I've said we've learned so like a couple months ago, and I think Travis jumped on me, but I, I think it stands that we have learned so much psychologically and about humans and about mental illnesses. We have better odds. Like, for, for example, people with mental illness in the 1900s, there's no telling what we would have done to them. We probably would have killed them or, or locked them away. Now we say, oh, we understand what this is. Therefore, we ought to uh, you know, put them in a mental home that is much more accommodating to their mental health. Right. Do you disagree with that, Pamper? Hello? Hello? Uh, I think I heard, I heard you. Uh, I thought you were directing the question, Travis. Uh, I was, but uh, he's in here. Uh, do you agree with that? He must have got up. I, I pretty much agree with you. I mean, I, I think that it's nearly universally true that um, anyone that we're talking to that still exists um, and is sentient is going to have that um, life being preferential to death. Yes. And we, can, it's, we, can it's, say, we can talk about it in a hypothetical, but if you actually believe that death was preferential to life... Right. Uh, That's when people go kill themselves. A conversation with a you would have a conversation with you. you would be having two dead people having a conversation no but but uh, oh, one thing i one thing i i think we 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 need to look at phenomenology with this too like sometimes people will be walking around with this ideation that they're fighting that death is preferential to life like it, or it might be right and they're they're wrestling with it they're, why why am i being pulled why am i being dragged towards this a uh, final uh, idea of suicide. You know, I think this is an important thing to, it's important for us to listen to the subjects, even though they might be, uh, you know, confused about what these signals are. But I think it's part of our uh, nature, uh, n- not not uh, nature, like how it normally plays out, but, you know, just like, okay, homosexuality is a rare occurrence in uh, in human nature not so rare as we w- once thought uh suicide ideation uh, th- these things are um these things are uh real um and uh you know i think i th- i think we need to re- i think we need to wrestle with that the, the fact that this um can emerge in uh, in the minds of animals um 
it, it's an and it and also we should we should think about like what that means uh conceptually like suicidal ideations right yeah yeah uh, guys, cool. we have a lot of you in the room. We have uh, many great thinkers. We got Dal, we got Mace, we got Cameron, Jack, Charlie, Thomas, all of you guys. Lady Dakini, um, jump in the uh, jump in the chat with us. It'd be great to hear from you. Yeah, uh, just remind them how to jump in the chat. I, I don't know if some of you knew. Uh, I know Thomas. Uh, yeah, you guys just click on your own profile pic, and then uh, it'll give you a, an opportunity to call, uh, join the call. This is uh, this is great. I'm liking yeah, so, these uh, thought experiments. To uh, Tom, to oh, talk about right. your 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 question about homosexuality, while while other people are getting the motivation to to get to come up with a good question for themselves, um, I I just want to say on uh, on a depending on what level of analysis you're talking about, um, homosexuality could be the best way for an organism that exists uh, you know just say on a different level of analysis than the, than the human individual body right so the the homosexual will not reproduce most likely right and there's probably a reason for that that has to do with environment and some of it may be genetic but also environmental but on a different level of analysis the Cells in the body um, are a different level of analysis. And then the tribe is a different level of analysis. And so if we have, let's just say, a tribe that is in an environmental situation where expanding the population would cause more pain and suffering and more death and, and maybe potentially result in the extinction of the tribe, then wouldn't that make homosexuality something that should come up naturally as a way to solve the problem of overpopulation you know if you look at it from a different level of analysis so maybe yeah yeah maybe homosexuality is uh, a natural way for the human population to uh, to mediate its own growth when we start filling up the size when we start filling up the box that we live in yeah, I think that's a, a more uh, look. You're going to get more accurate inferences if you start looking at things like that and not so like surface level. Like, how could there be evolutionary benefit uh, to uh, you know a homosexual? There's there's a much more uh, deep analysis that one needs to do to uh, understand that as opposed to just saying, you know, you're you're just a mouth you're a malfunctioned form of you know, of what's uh, normal. Jack, we're seeing your comments, man. Are you still there, uh, Zach? Ooh, I might have can to hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um. About the home. Uh, yeah, Jack. Uh, I'm about to read your comments in in a second. Uh, just by virtue of you doing your show last night, which is great, by the way. But uh, uh, Steven Pinker often points out about homosexuality that if you look at sheep, for example, about 10 percent of 10 percent, eight to 10 are homosexual. And yes, this has an evolutionary basis. But um, also, I mean, you know, all minds are not uniform. All minds are not like the same thing. As we've discussed, gender is fluid. Right. And um yeah, and it, it's another way evolutionarily, if you want to look at it, for humans to um, connect with other human beings, right? Like it doesn't have to be a certain sex dealing with another sex for there to be love and compassion and oxytocin release and all that good stuff, right? So if you can get it in another way that's quote unquote non traditional, you know, by all means, go for it. But uh, Jack. Uh, we were on the value conversation. He was saying, uh, you're thinking like uh, computer programming where things are assigned to value, but that's not how we act in life. Uh, he, he Earlier he said value is a very subjective judgment. He said, again, this value you're going after is the value set in a computer, not value in the ways it's used in the conversation. And he said, finally, people don't ask 
to exist, non-existence may be preferable to people who hate that they are, and being that they are, uh, they'd like not to die, but think not existing would have been better. But uh, on on to suicide. Let's talk about suicide for a second, because uh, back to existentialism. This is a pretty um, core tenet, believe it or not. Um, yeah, despair. Let's get into it. Yes, despair and the existential angst. So, uh, Travis, I'll ask you, what is when you hear existential angst or existential dread or existential crisis? What comes into your mind and what's the instance and what is the inner um, mechanics of the mind that kind of gets you deeper into this hole? Well, I think at the, at the fundamental basis of this, it's just, um, uh, you know, a lack of uh, pleasure in existence for whatever reason, this could be due to, uh, you know, physiological issues like, uh, you know, cancer, um, depression, uh, you know, it could be a byproduct of your environment. Um, but, but I do think, uh, things can get, uh, bad enough for whatever reason from a, from a purely from a, a pleasure perspective where, um, the, uh, the greatest pleasurable pursuit is to, uh, you know, to, 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 is to terminate. Yeah. To, to flip the life is preferential to death, uh, presupposition. And even, even in sometimes, sometimes the, uh, uh, health is preferential to sickness. Uh, sometimes people engage in this self harm in order to find some, uh, value in order to find some better, uh, better modes of pleasure that, you know, you start looking where it seems kind of counterintuitive to look, um, and well, you know, were, yeah. Uh, well, I was just going to say, um, if anybody's ever seen the YouTube channel Vsauce, uh, they have another show called Minefield. But one of the experiments they did was they sat people. I think it was on Vsauce or Minefield. They did. Uh, they sat people in a room and they sat them in there for ten minutes, and there was an electrical buzzer that would shock them, and it was basically to show that when when pushed to boredom. Humans will actually prefer a little bit of pain to just to, you know, for, for, to feel something, right? So these guys, they're sitting in the room and they're like, uh, somebody being in, in a couple minutes and 10, 15 minutes goes by. They start looking around the room. They see it. They hit it. They shock. And then, you know, yeah, you that's exactly, dude, that's they, exactly yeah, what then, I was talking about. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah, and that's a scientific experiment. It's very interesting, and it's the exact same thing that's going on with cutting, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, such a, such a, it's a, such a, you know, horrific thing. I don't know how many people have uh, experienced it. Like maybe had a friend or a family member uh, engaging in this kind of self harm. But I, I just want to say, if if anyone ever does come across this. Please encourage uh, this per the, this person or whoever whoever's going through this to um, get in touch with their family doctor or a, a medical professional of some kind. Uh, if that's impossible, there are if you do some Google searches, there are online uh, services that are um, charity organizations that provide uh, mental health care. Um, if you're in a, a spot. Uh, in a particular area of the world where it's like impossible for you to get such care. Um, so uh, yeah, the, uh, we, we need not say like, Oh, that person, it's just normal for that person to, you know, cut their arm. You know, th we need to, we need to get on top of this stuff and, and uh, try to get ahead of the, of course, the ultimate, um, uh, the ultimate outcome, I guess. Yeah. And, this ties back into a, a lot of people give existentialism a bad rap, right? And uh, just I want to say this real quick. I'm not saying I believe uh, all of this. Obviously, I'm just talking about the philosophy of existentialism. I mean, they considered 
um, to be to have be totally free will, like as people would say, libertarian free will. Um, they they considered determinism as it was used in the day. They need that people needed to escape from that because um, people would be using that as an excuse. Or, but anyways, like uh, Camus, he was uh, he was very uh, he attacked nihilism and specifically uh, cynicism because the main point of existentialism is once you realize at least once you accept this presupposition that everything is meaningless and you have to create your own um meaning uh basically all of that is um to keep you from killing yourself you have to push past the absurd is what he would call it and and really not kill yourself and uh i think he actually uh i thought i think maybe kim i don't know who said it but it he said, I'd rather be naive than a cynic because a cynic is a hopeless man who projects his hopelessness onto the world at large. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. You know, I, the, uh, one thing I say about that is, you, you know, you know, through COVID, I don't know how many messages I got about people in, in get, having this existential dread, right? And, uh, mm. you know, of course, the the main message is, you know, g- get in touch with your doctor, whatever it takes. I know it's tough. Sometimes it's tough for people to even get out of bed, right? I've been there 100%. Uh, but you know, you encourage them to get out of bed, get into that, the, uh, however, whatever they need to do to, to get themselves in front of a healthcare professional. And then, uh, you know, just, uh, I, I also like to lighten things up by saying like, you know, the, we have all the time in the world to be dead. Right. Um, <laughs> as far as I can tell, like, yeah. uh, so, you know, I know, I know th- there are struggles, things are painful, and again, I've been there. I, I, I know uh, at least how this feels, how this has felt to me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that's just part of uh, existence. It's part of uh, our phenomenology to, um, to uh, try to succeed through the struggles. Of course, if you agree with those two fund- fundamental presuppositions that life is preferential to death and health is preferential to sickness, uh, for people who don't, of course, that's um, that that becomes difficult. You, you essentially have to um, uh, start at the basis and and convince them that their presuppositions are uh, somehow less worthy than your subjective presuppositions. Looks like Nivik has joined us. Ah, oh, wonderful! Nivik, go ahead and unmute, man. Oh, hey, how's how's it going, Trev? Good. Let it rip. By the way, everyone. Uh, the new uh, Nivik show is going to be, it, it, we decided on Fridays, right, Nivik? Tuesdays. Oh, yeah, Tuesdays Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. That's 11 p.m. at night with uh, Nivik Eastern time. And it's basically going to be Nivik Talks. So it's going to be Nivik on a certain subject. Nivik and I are going to sit and uh, shoot the shit a bit at the beginning of each episode. And then... Uh, then you guys would be able to go one-on-one with Nivik. So I'm really looking forward to that. But Nivik, yeah, uh, Zach's been running a great discussion here about existentialism. What are some of your thoughts? Um, I, I, was, I was listening earlier, and um, we were talking, when, when, we t- when you were talking, when we were talking about life and what's beneficial, um, it, I, I, I was, I was, I, I, I want. I wanted to ask, um, like, define what destruction is and what creation is, and uh, yeah, I was. I was wondering if that could be defined. Go ahead, Zach. What do you think? Um, define what creation and destruction is. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, thanks for the really easy question. Um. I think it's impo- nearly impossible to discuss that without, without. Uh, it's impossible to discuss that and step out of the human frame at the same time. Um, first off, if you look at something like uh, when something happens, like the destruction of an object, uh, let's say there's a bomb that explodes. It's, it's like when when did that begin? Like when did that action begin? Did it begin? As soon as a bomb exploded, uh, did ten years 
down the line, the person who's suffering from the injuries, is that part of the destruction? Um, is the destruction material? Is the destruction of, um, uh, you know, of the, of the subjective uh, pleasure and pain hierarchy? Yeah, exactly. Uh, because it could right. be, it could be, um, it could be, it could all depend, right? Because uh, de de depending on the perspective, a, 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 a creation can be a destruction, and a destruction can be a creation. I mean, a yeah. creation, yeah, creation can be a destruction, and a de yeah, destruction can be a creation. I, I guess that's a, a, a shorter and more concise way to say what I was basically saying. Yes, I mean, who's to, uh, but humans, well, as we are, we, we like to draw these lines, and for mm -hmm. good reason. Um, yeah, but it, I mean, I, I just want to outline something like uh, a... Um, like a man and a woman have sex and a new, uh, you know, uh, human is eventually born into existence. Um, so that's creation. Uh, and then destruction would be okay. After that, you know, that the baby sitting there on the table, destruction of that, you know, of that, uh, entity, mm -hmm. at least their life, let's say destruction of yeah. their life would be to, you know, dis dismember it. Right. Uh, to, okay. To kill it. Because I was saying like, let's say I wanted a, 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 a rubble, a pile of rubble. I could have created a pile of rubble by breaking it down, f breaking something down from one state to another, to, yeah. to, to something else. Yeah. Right. Of, of destroying and then creating. So, so you could, so you could say you created the pile of rubble and destroyed the rock. And these yeah. would not be contradictory, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's the thing. That's like when you're talking about existence, mm -hmm. uh, and you're talking about life. I heard like Doctor mention like a rock and water, and that is in a constant state of existence, but life life isn't really like that life is like life you know what i mean because it's static it ex it exists but well i mean it's still matter though right? hmm? I, it's still matter um uh, but but Nivek, his his claim about uh you know uh, uh, let me ask you the same claim uh does does water have intrinsic value Um, like what do you I mean? guess it depends, what, right? What do you mean by value? Well, is it valued? But but that has that is a definition that has, I mean, word that has several different definitions, right? I mean, you can drink it, and I can drown you in it. Yeah, I'm talking. I'm talking about the philosophical school of values, right? Oh. I. Could you maybe refresh us on exactly what that is? I'm not trying to be pedantic. Well, let's let's go through. Uh, let's just go through the basic uh, here. Um, so it's a it's a branch uh, of ethics, right? Um, mm -hmm. Examining, uh, you know, to what degree uh, humans value things. Um, oh, so. If we, uh, uh, okay, le here, let me, uh, let me do this. Maybe we'll do value theory. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like, like it's a concept of, of worth, right? Like we're, um, like what does it mean to say that you value a rock? Right. 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 So what did what what does that mean? I'm gonna stop playing my game because now things got interesting. I, 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 I would say, <laughs> I mean, my answer would be, uh, like, say, I, like for example, I'll walk in my neighborhood, and every once in a while, I'll pick up a rock because I like how it looks. I like the aesthetics, just for whatever reason. Um, now, my value of that rock um, would be that I have imparted a meaning onto it um and i collect them and i kind of uh, compare contrast them right um now that could have a different that could have a functional value right i could use that as a hammer 
right? But um, and 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 that's the reason why I ask you. I mean, if you're talking about humans, then sure they have all sort. It, 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 well, I'm talking about any. It, I'm right? talking about any value. I'm talking about cultural, ethical, uh, aesthetic value. Where do, yeah. do do these values come from? They are they come from the subject, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a but, value, yeah. There's yeah. a value hierarchy. Yeah, sure. And but a but we construct meaning. But the claim that Doolittle was wrestling with, mm-hmm. he was trying to find an objective value in water, right? Well, well, yeah. I would say the objective value of water, if you can get be objective, is it has pro- what Doolittle was saying is water has properties, and these properties are objectively measurable. Now, th- that's why I don't really like the word value. Well, that's what um, I'm saying. Like, it, it va- you know, the, it, the okay, value of something valuable. has to be uh, conceptualized, right? Or sure. you have to pick a metric. You have to say, yeah, the water was valuable uh, to shaping this um, new uh, river divide. Right. Like, yeah, well, it, well, on a much more basic level, if you're a human and you like and you have the and you want to live and you're thirsty, it's very valuable for life, right? And and we come from water, right? Uh, life wouldn't be possible as far as we know without water. Um, so yeah, to humans, it has plenty of value, and also it can have a and those are functional values, but it could have other functional values. Like I want to put out a fire. Well, why does it do that? Well, like I said, it has properties. It doesn't have oxygen or, you know, oxygen molecules that are in a gaseous form that can ignite, right? Or if I, if I want to kill myself back to suicide, uh, it, it, it doesn't contain oxygen and I need oxygen to breathe and oxygen has a value too, right? So it it just, it totally depends on the, on the person and what their, uh, what their ends are, what their goals are, right? It looks, Um, yep. It looks like we have L, uh, L, uh, what do you got? On values I, or by anything. By the way, Travis, I have a theory I wanted to bring. Well, let's get L first, and then we'll go to Nivik. Yeah, um, it, values are not inherent, so right. Values are extremely subjective. Like there's nothing in in the universe that says water is valuable. Like we impose these values onto things. Yeah. So. Yeah, we can say we can say uh, we can make statements like water is valuable from a uh let's say from an abiogenesis perspective like we we could say that that's what the you know the evidence currently shows us but um but yeah to i mean this has been my question my entire life about the these like when people say okay objective morality or objectively valuable uh you know objective meaning i'm just like i'm happy to believe in these things if you can show me the object to measure and uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, sound reason as to why um, this is the uh, objective metric for that concept. Uh, can I say my theory? Yeah, sure. Yeah. We're both destruction and creation at the same time, because when I was talking about an object, like a piece of steel, that's static in existence, but, we break down when we move and um in in you know that that's that's partly destruction but we feed feed ourselves in eating in building up in the process of creation both mm-hmm. simultaneously happening at once so how i see life is a cycle of destruction and creation i completely agree with that i both happen yeah, it's very, it's yeah i think that's well put Nivik. yeah i completely agree um like you said if you if you eat an apple and uh you know drink some fluids and it you destroy them but you're you're creating uh it's gonna gonna go into your body and create your body um you know like literally as you said earlier we're all stardust so those stars exploding um whether they had meaning or intrinsic meaning or not way back when they exploded, they, they uh, were destroyed and we were created from that. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. It's like matter, space time, uh, you know, the, the termination of, uh, you know, of particles. It's like these, I think, um, yeah, these things are processes. These things do happen in reality. But I think uh, these concepts of value are of the subject. Um, yeah, what I was describing was the Ouroboros symbol of the snake uh, 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 eating itself and to live and, and I guess, killing itself at the same time. Uh, to, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the figure, yeah, the figure eight of the snake. Yeah, it's, it's eating itself in the struck in a, in a cycle of destruction and creation. Zach, I'm going to, uh, mute, um, but feel free to, uh, uh, wrap whenever you're ready to. And, um, right. you know, I think this was great. Everyone, please do join us on our discord server. If you're not a member yet, please do join us, drop a like as well. Uh, and if you liked this discussion, please consider sharing it on social media. Uh, take it away, Zach. How, how much uh, longer could I go? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's up to you, man. Okay. All right, cool. Because um, there are a few more concepts I want to get to. Uh, I guess we see L down in there. If you could maybe bring him in. Um, if you want to get in, L, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, what exactly? Oh. oh, it looked like I thought you were trying to get in, but you were already in and muted. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I suppose I'll ask you this then, because we haven't, um, impressively enough, we haven't got to Nietzsche in all of this. And <laughs> I mean, he, was, right. he was a wonderfully brilliant man. I mean, he was a professor and very ill, but he was he was a professor, full time professor back when he was when he was 24 years old. And this never happened back then. I mean, uh, truly yeah. a remarkable man, but a big part of existentialism. And he's on the main list is um living authentically and we talked about it earlier with like this ethical mode of existence and you you do things that are responsible um you have a conscience uh many would call it uh you, you know you do things all right guys if you want to continue listening to the discussion please head over to uh call in uh, I just want to thank uh, everyone who joined on YouTube here. I've been reading uh, Hillbilly and Balls uh, back and forth here. You guys feel free to continue that in the comment section under this video um, or uh, join us on Discord. I'm going to um, grab the Discord link here. I'm going to first give it to them on call in. Okay, good. I'm muted on the app. I just needed to make sure. Yeah, and you guys make sure you're subscribed on YouTube. We will be having conversations every day on call in. So uh, please do join us on that platform. And there's our Discord link to join us for our after party chats. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, this was Existentialism and the Human Condition with the Zemo uh, show. And as always, let art and science inspire. Make sure you guys make a call-in account. I'd love to hear from you guys on, on one of our shows. Thank you.